Let's pray before we come to the Word of God. Our Father, we are thankful that we can be found in your presence once again tonight. Uh, we thank the Lord for our opportunity and our privilege of looking into the pages of your holy word. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that uh, your word is true. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, it is indeed uh, a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we are able to this, this evening stand upon the wonderful promises uh, of your word. We thank you, Lord, as to how uh, your word is described in the Bible as being a, a sharp two-edged sword how it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And so, Father, tonight as we once again look into the pages of your word and we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, help us, Lord, to uh, apply what we hear and learn tonight. Uh, again, Father, it's our prayer that you'd open our eyes to the truths of your word and it's our prayer, Father, that you'd help us to be obedient to what we see and learn tonight. So bless us, we do pray, and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Acts chapter 18, that's where we'll go first in just the first three verses of Acts chapter 18, and we come across a, a couple in the Bible, I guess we could call them the dynamic duo. You might be thinking about Batman and Robin, but this is someone more important than those fictional characters. This is a, a husband and wife team uh, that the Bible makes mention of. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 3. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by the occupation they were tent makers. So the couple that we're looking at tonight, we're not just looking at one individual in the Bible, we're looking at a, a couple, and it's a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And they are mentioned just about six times in all of the Bible. And in fact, as we read and come across their names in the Bible, we see that they are a couple that move a lot. Now, now some of us have moved a lot in our lives. I think Trace and I have moved quite a bit, and quite a big distance, but some of us have, have moved quite a lot in life, some, some perhaps not so much, and I, I don't think there's any real fun in moving, but I'd like you to notice that they were a people that moved. We find them in Rome, then they are in Corinth, they go down to Ephesus, and they go back to Rome again. So they were a couple, we could say, that were on the move for God. But in all of their moves, they were seeking to be a blessing to God's people, and more importantly, to honor God and what they did. Uh, it's also interesting to find that with Aquila and Priscilla, that they never mentioned separately. They're always uh, mentioned together. So they were a husband and wife team, but they really acted as one in all that they did. So they were one physically, we could say, and they were one spiritually. And for those of you who are married tonight, you can see a wonderful example of a husband and wife that were a team in the work of God. Hudson Taylor said this, he said, a light that does not shine beautifully around the family table at home is not fit to rush a long way off to do a great service elsewhere. I think it's a wonderful thing to see a husband and wife that love one another, love the Lord, and are faithfully serving him uh, wherever they may be. And we are greatly encouraged and challenged by this couple. Now, we don't know where it was or when it was or how it was that they came to become Christians. We know that they were Jews. And so when they were in Rome, they were expelled from Rome because of their original Jewish faith. But as Jews, they would have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people think that perhaps Paul had led them to the Lord. Uh, but the Bible doesn't tell us that anyway. It just tells us in our text tonight that they came together because they had the same trade. Uh, in verse 3 it talks about the fact that they were tent makers by trade. So the conversion isn't recorded for us uh, in the Bible, but everything about them, everything that they did, uh, tells us that they were devout followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So I'd like to just uh, pick up on three things about their lives tonight. And the first thing that I would draw to your attention is how that they were helpful to the men of God. So we see firstly that one of the characteristics about Aquila and Priscilla is that they were greatly used by God to help other men in their service for God. So you could say that they were a part and a, 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 a very important part of the ministry of people that they came into contact with. Now I think each one of us tonight were able to look back on our lives and recognize that there were certain people that kind of just stood out uh, and helped us and encouraged us. And I think particularly as younger Christians, we can look back uh, as to how there, there were certain people that were hugely influential in our lives. And I know that when I think back to when I was a younger Christian, you know, there were a, a couple uh, that really stood out and were a great blessing to me. And I suspect they didn't realize how much of an impact they were in my life, but they were. They, in just about everything that they did, they stood as a great example, always encouraging, always, you know, seeking to be a blessing. And, you know, I think all of us can say that there were those along the way that have, that have helped. And even, of course, in recent years, we all have people around us that are a help to us uh, in the ministry. And it was with people like Aquila and Priscilla that they really had a heart for other people. In fact, when they saw that somebody was serving the Lord, they made it their business to get behind that person, to come alongside that person, if you like, uh, to help them uh, in their ministry. So we read in Acts chapter 18 as to how they firstly befriended uh, the Apostle Paul. So we read of their encouraging ministry with the Apostle Paul. So as we just read in, in Acts chapter 18, uh, Paul had come down to where Aquila and Priscilla were. And uh, now, now Paul, the Bible says in verse 1 that he had departed from Athens. That was at the end of his second missionary journey. And his second missionary journey was a, a journey that was fraught with a great deal of difficulty, a great deal of hardship, a great deal of personal suffering for the Apostle Paul. But here he comes, and he comes into contact into, uh, to, to these great uh, Christians, this, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and we find that they have a, a great deal in common, and there's a sense of encouragement. Now, Paul's ministry, his second missionary journey, the journey was, it, it was greatly, it was fruitful, but it came at a tremendous personal cost to him. And so when he arrived in Corinth, the idea that we get is that he was somebody that was, uh, he was spent physically and he would have been spent emotionally, we could understand, and even spiritually, he was really at a time of his life where he needed somebody to come alongside. Now the Bible says that they came together, they were tent makers by trade. Now the Apostle Paul, although he would have originally have been a Pharisee, he had learnt the trade of being a tent maker. It is said that in that day and age that the, a Jewish father would always make sure that he would teach his son a particular trade. Even if, they, even if the person was a rabbi, he would make sure that he would teach his son a trade. They would say, if you do not teach your son how to work, then you're going to teach him how to steal. So they made a very important, a very important in, uh, influence in the life was to learn the trade. And Paul, his lot was to learn how to uh, make tents. They, uh, come into con Paul comes into contact with Aquila and Priscilla. They themselves had not been in Corinth very long. They had been expelled from Ro Rome because of the fact that they were Jews, as we read. They were commanded to leave the city. When they arrive in Corinth, they set up a tent-making business, uh, and the Apostle Paul meets up with them. They employ him, they give him some work to do, and he's able to uh, provide for himself and also have this kind of fellowship with them. And I'd like you to notice that uh, as he works with them in, in uh, Corinth, in verse 4, the Bible says that he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews uh, and the Greeks. So while he's there, don't just think he's just sitting in a corner making tents. While he's there in Corinth, 
He's busy serving the Lord faithfully. That's what he does wherever he goes. And you can well imagine that Aquila and Priscilla were alongside him serving the Lord. And in Romans chapter 16, uh, Paul makes mention of Aquila and Priscilla again there. And he speaks of them as being fellow helpers in Christ Jesus. So they were alongside him in the ministry. They, you could say they helped him financially because they gave him work to do. But they helped him spiritually. They helped him as, they sought, as he sought to win uh, souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were the people that brought him great joy. And then in, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 3 and 4, uh, he says of them, he says, Greet Priscilla, this is Romans 16, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, and to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So I'll... I'll speak about this fact of the sacrificial aspect of their life later, but I'd like you to notice the latter part of verse 4, that they were a blessing not just to Paul, but also to all the other churches of the Gentiles as well. So, you know, when I, when I think about Aquila and Priscilla, I get the idea that they were a couple, that it didn't matter who they were with or what church they were in, they were making sure that they were being a blessing and a help to the people that were serving in that church. They were like a breath of fresh air. They were like a cool drink to a parched throat. They were just a blessing to all that they came into contact with. So Paul speaks of them as being a great encouragement. People that kind of came alongside, they were fellow helpers, fellow servants uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we think about the way that they helped other men in the ministry, I'd like you to notice not just the encouragement that they gave to Paul, but I'd also like you to notice the edification of Apollos. Now, we've not spoken about Apollos yet. I think most of you would understand something of who he is. But in the same way that God brought Aquila and Priscilla into the life of the Apostle Paul just when he needed them, God also used Aquila and Priscilla and brought them into the life of this man uh, by the name of Apollos at a very important and crucial time in his life. If you go back to Acts chapter 18 and look at verse 24 to verse 26. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So evidently, Apollos was somebody that had become a follower of Christ, under the ministry of John the Baptist. And the Bible speaks of him as being somebody that was quite a skilled speaker. And he was a, someone that was also a dedicated scholar. But while he was a great man and mighty in the scriptures, there were certain things that he did not quite understand. So the Bible says that he only knew the baptism of John. And this is where Aquila and Priscilla come in. Because they heard him speaking in the synagogue. They noted that he taught diligently the things of the Lord. But as verse 25 says, they noted that he only knew the baptism of John. So there was something, if you like, about his preaching that was not quite accurate. He didn't have a full and complete knowledge of the gospel. Now they didn't stand up and say, sir, what you are saying is wrong. They didn't say, listen, Apollos, we'll have nothing to do with you because you have an incomplete understanding of the gospel. They didn't rebuke him publicly, neither did they try and correct him publicly. I'd like you to notice what they did, is that they took him in, and in a very private and in a very careful way, they helped him better to understand the gospel in its entirety. And, and how we think they may have done this is that they very well took him 
They were, they were very, um, you know, gracious hosts. They took him into their home and they would have taken the time to go through the gospel and the, uh, give him a more clearer understanding uh, of the word of God. So the Bible says that they expounded unto him. So that, that word expound literally means they exposed him to the gospel or explained the gospel more clearly to him. So we can say they explained to him the way of God more perfectly. So it's a wonderful way in which they approach him. They recognize that his knowledge is incomplete. They bring him under their wing and they begin to teach and to coach and to instruct him in the things of God. Now here is a great preacher. He was an eloquent preacher. And I, I like this about Apollos. Now we'll look at this man in some time to come, but I like this about him, that he was also willing to be taught. He didn't say, listen, I've been, to the, I've been under the ministry of John the Baptist. He didn't say, listen, you're just a husband and wife team. You've not been to Bible college. You're tent makers. You're not going to teach me. I'm going to teach you. This wasn't his attitude. He said, he, he kind of just submitted to the teaching that he would receive from this husband and wife team. And so the idea that we get from this is that the teaching that he would have received from Aquila and Priscilla, it would have been something that touched his heart, moved his heart, helped him to understand, and of course God would in turn continue to use him for the furtherance of the gospel. And I like to think that he perhaps learned more from this husband and wife team than perhaps he ever could have learned in the classroom. He was taken under their wing and they took the time to explain to him the word of God perfectly. So the first thing that we think about with Aquila and Priscilla is how they helped men of God in their ministry. They encouraged Paul and they edified Apollos. They were a people that had the work of God on their hearts and the men of God on their hearts and they were doing what they could to see the work uh, continue. So they were helpful to the men of God. And then secondly, as I've just intimated, they were helpful in the work of God. So they weren't just helpful uh, in ministering to the men of God, but also in the work of God. Because the thing with Aquila and Priscilla is that wherever you find them, these six times where the Bible mentions them, you always come across them and they're serving the Lord whether they're in Corinth, or whether they're at Ephesus, or whether they're back at Rome, wherever you find them, they're faithfully serving the Lord. That's a great challenge to us. Proverbs says in chapter 20 and verse 6, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. And I, I think with Aquila and Priscilla, that we find a couple that were most definitely faithful. I'd like you to notice how they were faithful. They were faithful in their willing service. In, uh, we go to Romans 16 again for this, in verse 3. Uh, Paul writes of them, he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So I intimated this early on, but they were, they were working together with Paul. They were serving God in their working together with Paul. And it would seem to me that from the very first time that they met Paul, they attached themselves to him and to his ministry so that the gospel could be furthered. They worked with him in any way that they could, and they helped him in his ministry. And then we also read as to the fact in, in Acts chapter 18 that when Paul would leave Corinth, they didn't stand saying, well, good power, Paul, nice meeting you. You made fantastic tents, and by the way, you were a good preacher. They didn't do that. They, they went with him along his journey to Antioch. So in Acts chapter 18, verse 18, the Bible says that Paul, after this stayed there yet a good while, then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. Now, I don't think that Priscilla and Aquila were just following a man. I think they were following a ministry. 
They were seeking to be faithful to the work of God where they could. And so they attached themselves to Paul. They were helpers together with the Apostle Paul. And so they worked together. And uh, so it's wonderful to see their dedication to the work of God. You know, sometimes as believers, particularly as we get older, we, have, we make this mistake. We always think to ourselves something like this. You know, years ago, in, in my day, we often hear people say, years ago, in my day, this is what we used to do to serve the Lord. We used to pick up the children. We used to get involved in the Sunday school. We used to... You know, the fact of the matter is, we shouldn't be thinking of yesteryear's service. We should be thinking about today's service. Aquila and Priscilla, they didn't say, well, you know, we used to help the Apostle Paul down in Corinth. No, they continued on in their service, and they helped him as he went down to Antioch. So don't be thinking to yourself, you know, years ago, it used to be so great years ago as to how the Lord used to bless in that bygone era. We should be thinking, well, today, this is the day that the Lord has made. And how can we today be fervent in our service for God? Things are never going to be the same. But listen, we've got blessings today that people didn't have yesterday. And they certainly did have blessings that we perhaps don't have today. But listen, let's be thinking to ourselves, how can I serve God effectively where I am right now? This was the attitude of Aquila and Priscilla. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, God wants to humble you and fill you with himself and control you so that you become a part of the eternal work that God wants to do in our day. I like that. Not yesterday, but in our day. God's work is not complete. God isn't the God of yesterday. We need to recognize that there's a work that God wants us to be involved in today. And so well, let's ask ourselves, not to, what did they used to do? How, how did I serve? How am I serving? What am I doing for God today? That's what we should be asking ourselves. And then another thing, of course, when you think about that, sometimes we can think, you know, the part that I play just seems to be so small. But, you know, we need to recognize that all of us working together are going to be fulfilling a vital part in the plan of God. We all cannot play the same part, but whatever we do, we're working together for the same eternal cause. So we shouldn't just be thinking, well, this is just a small, insignificant thing. God is interested in what we might think to be small, but he wants to use that for his eternal glory. So we see that they were a couple that were willing in their service of God, wanting to help where they could. And then another thing I'd like you to notice in the way that they uh, were faithful in serving in the work is in the sacrifice that they were willing to make. We read this earlier, but I'll take you to the verse again in Romans chapter 16 and verse 4. And this verse gives to us a hint of the depth of the faithfulness of this wonderful, faithful couple. The Bible speaks of them who, Paul says, who have for my life laid down their own necks. That's an interesting phrase. I don't think that phrase is found anywhere else in the Bible. Who for my life have laid down their necks. You know, the idea is, is that they're kind of putting their head down under the executioner's axe. That's the idea behind that verse. So at some point, now the Bible doesn't give us the specifics, but at some point in their life and in their ministry and in their working alongside the Apostle Paul, they did something that risked their own lives so that the work of God could continue. We don't know when it was for sure or how it was, but we do know that Paul uh, did not go unnoticed and he recognized that they had willingly risk their lives. Now somebody said this, that the church of Jesus Christ has been built on the blood of those who are willing to pay the ultimate price rather than be unfaithful to their Lord. Down through the centuries, 
the church has been greatly helped by those who were willing not just willing, but who actually did give their lives for the cause of Christ. In fact, an early church father said this, he said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And I'd like to just read to you a quote from Fox's Book of Martyrs. If ever you want to read something to give you an insight as to how people have suffered for the cause of Christ, they are, it's a whole bunch of snapshots from history that talk about how people had suffered for Christ. The, a, a widow by the name of Felictus, and it was during the time of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. She had seven sons whom she had instructed in Christianity. Soon she and her sons were called before the Emperor of Rome he tried in vain to induce them to deny Christ and worship the false gods. He appealed to the feeling of the mother in Philictus, but she replied that her sons would know how to choose between everlasting life and everlasting death. One by one, the seven sons were required to renounce Christ, but their mother exhorted them to stand firm and reminded them what a great reward awaited them in glory. As she stood by, she saw her elder scourged with loaded thongs till he died. The next two were beaten to death with clubs. The fourth was flung from a cliff, the other three beheaded. Then, in the midst of her dead, she praised God that he, would, that he had allowed her seven sons to be counted worthy to die for the name of Christ. At length, and after prolonged and excruciating torture, she was herself beheaded. Now there's a person, this is a real story, this is a real event that took place in this family that would lay down their lives, willingly lay down their lives rather than denounce the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It kind of gives us uh, an idea as to the kind of metal that Aquila and Priscilla were made from. And you know when I read of accounts like this, as to how they would willingly lay down their life. And you, could, you can imagine what it must be like for a mother to see her own children go through such terrible torture and then uh, to be killed. When you think about that, I sometimes wonder how today's Christians would fare. When we consider the shallowness of our devotion, how easily we kind of get out of serving the Lord or any kind of heartache or discomfort, we quickly want to throw in the towel. But men and women of yesteryear, they were made of a stronger and firmer stuff, and they would willingly lay down their lives for the cause of Christ. That's how it was with Aquila and Priscilla. Paul said of them, they willingly had risked their lives, laid down their necks for him. So they were faithful to the work of God, they were helpful to the men of God. And then lastly tonight, I'd like you to notice that they were careful for the church of God. A third inspiring characteristic of Aquila and Priscilla is the way in which they viewed the church and the way that God used them and blessed them in ministering in the church as well. Again, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 now, in verse 19, uh, Paul, in his concluding address, he says... The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So evidently, they were a people or a couple that had church services in their home. And then we read of a similar thing in uh, Romans chapter 16 and verse 5 where in verse 3, again, we have Greek Priscilla and Aquila, and then he says, you know, you've laid, they've laid down their life, who, had, who for my life laid down their own necks, rather. He says, not unto, unto whom not only I give thanks, but notice he says, but, un, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So they were a blessing to other churches as well. But then in verse 5, he says, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. 
So it seems to me that with Aquila and Priscilla, the church was a very important part of their life and of their ministry. And I do believe that when we're, ser when we're serious about God, that we're serious about the church. I don't think that we can divorce the church from our relationship and our walk with God. And you can see that with Aquila and Priscilla, they were a couple that saw the importance of the New Testament church. Now, I'd like you to notice a couple of things about this. First, I'd like you to notice that there was a building called their house that spoke of their church. So there was a, a church group, if you like, that would meet in their home. Now, when we read this, we need to understand that it's quite different to how it is now nowadays. We, we're able to meet in a church building like we have the pleasure of doing tonight. And, but churches in those days, they would often meet underground, unnoticed, and they would often meet in the homes of people. But the house, the place where people lived, it was just a building where the church, because the church isn't a building, the church is made up of people. We're loving, uh, living stones, I beg your pardon, living stones, living believers that make up the church. And their house was used so that the church could come together and worship and serve God. And it was often the case where a person's private dwelling place would be used where believers could gather together for fellowship, where they could observe the Lord's Supper, and where they could hear the preaching of the Word of God, and where they could, could collectively worship. But let's not confuse this with the idea that sometimes people have where for whatever reason they give up on the church and say, well, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'll have church at home. And so dad says, well, let's, you know, we, let's get around the dining room table. Dad reads the Bible. Let's sing a couple of hymns, hymns you know, and uh, say a prayer and then get on with their day. That's not church. We shouldn't confuse a family that says we're not going to church with having a prayer meeting at home and think, well, that is church. That is not church. We need to recognize that the church that was in their home was a church that had a pastor, would have had deacons, would have had a structure, they would have been interested in missions, they would have broke the, the uh, uh, you know, had breaking of bread services. It was a church that would operate just like any other church would, except it was held in a home of somebody. So we need to understand that the church is made up of you and I, and we meet together. And if we didn't meet in this building and we met under a tree somewhere, that would still be our church. But don't think that just you, you can stay at home and have church at home. That's not church. That's just family devotion. That's all that it is. But with Aquila and Priscilla, they opened their, their doors and they made their church, their home, I beg your pardon, a church building. They had left Rome earlier. And now they returned back to Rome, and perhaps one of the first things that they did, as they saw the believers scattered in Rome, is let's get people together, we'll open the doors of our home, and we'll have church. We'll have preaching, we'll have teaching, we'll get together so that we can collectively worship, and we're going to be a church, but we're going to be meeting in our home. And what a blessing it was for Aquila and Priscilla because they were living in a home and they opened their doors so that their home was being used as a place where believers were gathered together to worship God. Where believers were gathered together so that they could be instructed in the things of God. Where believers were gathered together so that they could be encouraged to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel. It was a place where people were being used and encouraged and built up in the things of God. They were a people that had opened the doors of their hearts so that they could have a church. And then I'd like you to notice that not only did they have church in their home, but they were a blessing to the church. Do you get the idea tonight as we come to a conclusion that wherever Aquila and Priscilla were, 
they were a blessing. Nobody said, oh boy, it's Aquila and Priscilla again. Everybody said, look at this, it's Aquila and Priscilla. And they've come into the church, and they've come into our lives, and they're going to encourage, and they're going to edify, and they're going to help us. They're a blessing. They were a blessing wherever they were. And I'm sure that with Aquila and Priscilla, whoever came across their path, they would take them under their wing where they could and encourage them and build them up in the faith, all for the glory of God. So we look at this wonderful, dynamic duo in the Word of God, a husband and wife team who collectively, as one, are seeking to work for the glory of God. So may we be encouraged tonight, there are a number of us here tonight who are married, may we be encouraged that as husband and as wife, we would work together as one in seeking to be a blessing in the lives of people that we come into contact with. And perhaps you're single tonight, that doesn't exclude you, or you just need to take and learn from what you see with this wonderful uh, couple, that you likewise try and be a blessing to those that are serving God. You try likewise and be faithful to the work of God, and uh, in, in any way that you can, seek to be a blessing so that God's work is going to be furthered, and so that the gospel is going to continue to be preached. So may the Lord bless you to think about this wonderful, faithful couple, Aquila and Priscilla. They were helpful to the men of God, they were faithful to the work of God, and they were careful for the church of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful tonight for the wonderful examples that we see in the Word of God.